Good afternoon, everyone. Good My afternoon. name is Tia Teriak. I am pleased to welcome you to What's Up Doc, a monthly lecture program brought to you by the Concord Hospital Trust. We hope the new year is off to a great start for all of you. Concord Hospital Trust would like to recognize and thank the Walker Lecture Series for their generous sponsorship of What's Up Doc. The Walker Lecture Series offers a wide variety of programs on history, literature, art, and science, as well as dramatic, musical, and literary performances. And all events are free to the public and are held at the Concord City Auditorium. We encourage you to go to the walkerlecture.org um, website and check out their schedule that's coming for the spring. Today, What's Up Doc is proud to welcome Dr. Ann Granfield from Concord Surgical Associates as our special guest physician today. Dr. Granfield's area of interest include minimally invasive surgery, colon and rectal cancer, inflammatory bowel disease, and anorectal disease. Dr. Granfield attended medical school at the University of Massachusetts Medical School she completed her residency at Warren Albert Medical School of Brown University, and she also completed two fellowships, one at Miriam Hospital in Providence, Rhode Island, and a second one at Strong Memorial Hospital at the University of Rochester. Dr. Granfield holds a board certification in surgery from the American Board of Surgery, and she also holds another board certification from the American Board of Colon and Rectal Surgery. Dr. Granfield joined Concord Hospital Health System in 2019. Today, Dr. Granfield's presentation will focus on the latest updates in colon and rectal surgery. When not caring for her patients, uh, Dr. Granfield and her husband, they live in Hopkinton and are kept busy by a two-year-old daughter that they have. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Granfield. Hello, good afternoon. As stated, my name is Annie Granfield, and I'd like to talk to you about some updates in colon and rectal surgery. I have no disclosures. I will say I have quite a few photos of areas of the anatomy, and just so everyone's aware, um, it can be it can be. A little graphic to those who are unaware of it so that's coming I didn't realize I was gonna get an intro so this is my intro um, this is beautiful Providence Rhode Island where I lived for six years where I completed my surgical residency and then was a general surgeon and I did a transition of fellowship year as well and this is beautiful Rochester New York where I did my colon and rectal surgery fellowship one of the reasons I love colorectal surgery so much is that there is a quite a breadth of cases and pathology that I'm able to take care of. And so I feel as though it's only fitting that my updates are going to kind of span the practice of colon and rectal surgery. I'm going to start off first with some updates to the colonoscopy screening guidelines. I'm then going to transfer over and discuss some common anal rectal problems such as hemorrhoids and anal fissures. Then I'm going to talk about diverticular disease, which is one of the big reasons that people have elective colon surgery. Then we're going to talk a little bit about the ERAS protocol, which stands for Enhanced Recovery After Surgery, which is a real um, paradigm shift in the way that we take care of elective, these elective patients. Then we're going to talk a little bit about a procedure called TAMIS, which I perform, um, which is for polyps and very early rectal cancers in select patients. And then finally, we're going to discuss rectal cancer, which is one of my areas of interest and passions, as well as um, some exciting stuff moving forward with some frailty evaluation. Colon cancer screening recommendations used to start at age 50, as everyone can remember. That was sort of this thing that you had to do. It was part of um, growing up or getting older. Um, and with new evidence, I believe it was in 2018, the recommendations have changed from age 50 to age 45 in average risk individuals. That's people who don't have any history of inflammatory bowel disease, people who don't have any family history of colon or rectal cancer. That would be an average risk person. This is the United States Preventative Services Task Force recommendations that, again, screening begin at age 45 for average risk people. Um, how do we implement this recommendation? So it's not just colonoscopies. 
Um, you know, you can also get this highly sensitive guaiac fecal occult blood test or a fecal immunochemical mm -hmm. test that is a DNA test on your stool. You can get that once a year. Um, you can get a CT colonography, which is similar to a colonoscopy, where basically it's a specialized CT scan where you get some contrast material injected into your rectum that takes a look at the colon. Um, the other option would be flexible sigmoidoscopy or, or a partial colonoscopy every five years or, you know, a, a combination of these things or finally colonoscopy at age, at, at every 10 years depending upon risk. What I think is important is that, and what I really want to stress is that colon cancer is so treatable and it's so important that we get and we advocate for patients to get the screening that they need, as I said, for this very treatable and very common disease. Colon cancer is, I believe, the second most common cancer among adults. And as I said, it's very, very treatable. What's also, what I'd like to also share is that the American College of Gastroenterologists, the American College of Colon and Rectal Surgeons, and the United States Preventative Services Task Force have all gotten on board and we all agree 45 is the new age. So again, just to put it out there that everybody gets your colonoscopies. What I think is also important is I think maybe some of the messaging has been lost about colonoscopies. It's not just prevention of colon cancer. It's actually, excuse me, it's not just um, diagnosis of colon cancer, it's really prevention. When you think about the fact that the majority of colon cancers arise from polyps, and this is a schematic of what it takes for a cell to get from kind of normal to cancers. So <clears throat> what a polyp means basically is that there are some abnormal cells that some people make more polyps than others. A polyp is by definition what's called low-grade dysplasia. What I really like about this slide is that you can see normal, this is, I guess normal tissue would really be over here. And then a little bit abnormal tissue is, is with the polyp. That's what a polyp is. It's a little bit abnormal tissue that can progress to cancers. And then as we continue on, we go from low-grade dysplasia to then high-grade dysplasia, which is like a step closer to cancer, to then cancer. And I think maybe the me maybe we haven't done a great job with the messaging because it's not just colon. Because I think sometimes people think, well, I'd know if something's wrong. I'd know if something's wrong in my body, and I totally get that. However, I can't tell you how many people I operate on for something that was just found incidentally, and I just feel so strongly that it's something that people should that we should really make sure that we're, you know, people are getting screened and, and getting the care that they need. Because again, it's not just colon cancer detection, it's colon cancer prevention. If you get that polyp when it's a polyp, not only are you gonna be screened more, because now, now you've proven that you make polyps, you're gonna get screened more, usually every three to five years, depending upon what they find. And they're gonna remove things that potentially could turn into colon cancer. So I think it's really important. The other thing I will say also, is that sometimes people ha come to see me if they have a polyp that's unresectable, meaning that the GI doctors are unable to remove it with the colonoscope. Those people I operate on as though it's a cancer because as you can see here with this polyp, this is some polyp tissue, but maybe there's this little piece of cancer here. The statistic that I give people basically is that any polyp above two centimeters has a 40% risk of having cancer in it. So if you've got a polyp that's four centimeters, obviously that risk is gonna increase. So this is also another good reason I see folks is to remove, we kind of treat that polyp as though it's cancer until proven otherwise. <laughs> An underlying theme of my talk is gonna be treat things like they're cancer until proven otherwise. When I told my family that I wanted to go to medical school, they were very happy for me, and very excited and told all of their friends in medical school and I decided that I wanted to become a surgeon. When I told my family, hey, I'm gonna be a surgeon. Again, very excited, told all their friends, very excited for me. When I told my family that I wanted to be a colon and rectal surgeon, the excitement wasn't really there anymore. <laughs> and, which is understandable. But then when they ask me why I wanna be a colon and rectal surgeon, what I tell them is that, although it may not be glamorous, you can help people with really common problems take away the quality of their life. So yes, although hemorrhoids are hemorrhoids and you know maybe uh, a pain in, in the butt as it were, um, when I take care of people with hemorrhoids, I think that it is really my opportunity to give them the best education so that they can live better lives moving forward. 
So let's begin with one of my favorite things, which are hemorrhoids. There's a lot of, you know, again, as a colorectal surgeon, I spend a lot of time in a part of the body that a lot of people don't. And so I am very familiar with this area and so know a lot more than other people would. Hemorrhoids are normal in a normal part of anatomy. There are two kinds of hemorrhoids. These are internal hemorrhoids, which are normal part of anatomy. And these are external hemorrhoids. As I said, internal hemorrhoids are part of normal anatomy. Everybody has internal hemorrhoids. They contribute about 10 to 15% of continence, the ability to have a bowel movement when and where is appropriate. And hemorrhoids are just a bundle of blood vessels. So anything that you do that puts pressure on your pelvis is gonna make those blood vessels get larger. The same way that if you're maybe on your feet all day or walking a lot, your legs are gonna get swollen at the end of the day. Like I said, internal hemorrhoids are part of normal anatomy. External hemorrhoids, not necessarily part of quote unquote normal anatomy, but certainly a normal variant that can happen through a variety of activities that we're gonna talk about shortly. Internal hemorrhoids are staged, basically based upon how large they are and what they do. Stage one will just basically normal internal hemorrhoids, part of normal anatomy. Stage two, basically a little bit larger, and these stage two hemorrhoids can prolapse or pop in and out of the anal canal. Stage two means pops out and goes back in on its own. Stage three means pops out and you have to manually push them back in on, you know, with the uh, uh, patient. And then stage four pops out, stays out, and sometimes these people need emergency surgery, which we're gonna get to. Again, this is part of normal anatomy. In external hemorrhoids, part of, you know, can be a normal variant, but not necessarily everyone has hemorrhoids. Hemorrhoids become symptomatic. Internal hemorrhoids tend to bleed, like I said, in prolapse, pop in and out. And then external hemorrhoids are gonna thrombose, or basically the blood that's in there is gonna clot off. You're gonna have a hard lump on the outside of the anal canal, and that's very painful. If you see a surgeon or a physician or someone else who feels comfortable doing it, they can basically get that blood out of there and make you feel better. So this is where the photos are gonna get a little graphic. So everyone, actually, not, not quite this one yet, but excellent. <laughs> so again, hemorrhoids are a factor of pressure on your pelvis. So what's gonna cause pressure on your pelvis? Basically, straining to have a bowel movement, sitting on the toilet longer than five minutes, being a power lifter, having babies. This is me and my daughter when I was very pregnant. Good luck to those scrub pants. And so those are the things that are gonna cause hemorrhoids. So again, these are when the photos get a little graphic. So these are all thrombosed external hemorrhoids. And so basically you can see, this, is, this looks like skin out here, it's just quite enlarged, and it looks a little bit purplish. Again, hemorrhoids are gonna be a symptom of a lot of pressure in your pelvis. So if, you, if this happens to you, or someone you care about, and you come see a surgeon within 72 hours, we basically, can incise this, evacuate that blood clot, and that will really make you feel a lot better. Whenever I see anyone for hemorrhoids, where it always starts and begins with conservative or non-surgical management. And the reason for that is, unlike your gallbladder or your appendix that I can take out once and it never bothers you again, I could take out all your hemorrhoids in the operating room, and if there's any of that pressure on the pelvis, so straining to have a bowel movement, sitting on the toilet longer than five minutes, power lifter, babies, they can come back. So what I tell everybody is first and foremost, you gotta drink more water. You know, the colon's job really is to absorb water. So that we're gonna do have a little anatomy sesh right now. This is where the small intestine joins up with the large intestine right here, what's called in the right lower quadrant called the ileocecal junction. And then liquid stool goes from the right side all the way around down to the rectum and anus. In that time, the colon is basically absorbing water to make what looks over here like very liquid, liquid stool that goes all the way over here to solid stool. So if you're not drinking enough water, your stool is gonna be really hard. So it always starts off first with 64 ounces of water. And I've always found it helpful if you're gonna give someone recommendations, you have to give them numbers. Don't just say drink more water. Because maybe someone's more water is like, oh, I'll have two bottles of water instead of four or whatever. The other thing that's so important is fiber. I love fiber so much. It is the best. 
fiber basically fixes whatever the problem is with your bowel movements. So if your stools are too loose, fiber is going to make water kind of come in with the material and make it a little bit more solidified. And if your stools are too hard, fiber is going to bring water into the stools. So really, honestly, whatever the problem is, fiber is going to fix it. I generally recommend a powder fiber supplement. And that's because you know they make gummies, capsules, make all kinds of things that also are fiber. However, the thing that makes me nervous about that is that water and fiber really work best together. So if you were to like have a bunch of those gummies and then not drink any water, it's not going to go great for you. So that's why water and fiber really have to go together. Again, we're going to talk about do not strain, and that pressure on the pelvis. Do not sit on the toilet longer than five minutes. I don't know what it is, but no offense to the gentlemen in the audience, this seems to be a strictly gentleman problem. This, it seems like most of the, the time the men that come and see me in the office are doing this. And the women are like, I got kids, I got, I got stuff to do. So that's just a little um, editorial comment. And then for folks who are feeling like they're having, still having some trouble, feeling like they still have to strain quite a bit to have a bowel movement, those are the folks that I tell them to use Miralax as needed. Miralax, I think, is a gentle laxative. It's not a stimulant laxative. It's not going to stimulate your colon cells to secrete water. It's more of an osmotic laxative, which basically just means it brings water into the cells. It brings water into the stool. It makes it, things easier to pass. And then, as I said, everything's colon cancer until proven otherwise. I like everybody to get a colonoscopy. Now, I am a colon and rectal surgeon, so I see things that need colon and rectal surgery. So I've seen a number of younger people who have colon or rectal cancer who were told that they have who were told that they have hemorrhoids or told, you know, et cetera, et cetera, or maybe they just had a baby. So I feel really strongly that anybody who has blood in their stool over the age of 25, and frankly, I think even if you're maybe under 25, because that's going to rule out to make sure you don't have any kind of advanced polyp, cancer, inflammatory bowel disease. A colonoscopy, I think, is really important um, diagnostically. So when we talk about treatment after the conservative management or the non-surgical management, which by the way is more of like a lifestyle change, that's just kind of the way it's got to be now. Water and fiber always and forever. So after that, then the next thing that we can do is something called internal hemorrhoid banding. This is a picture of a prolapsed internal hemorrhoid. This looks different than those other pictures I showed you, right? So this kind of looks a little shiny. This, is, this looks like mucosa. This basically is prolapsed internal hemorrhoid. Now, this is also what I do for a living, so I get that if you guys are like, no, I don't know what you're talking about, that looks like the other one. Okay, but this is a prolapsed internal hemorrhoid. Hemorrhoid banding is helpful for hemorrhoids that pop out. It's something that we can do in the office. It is, um, I usually, if you were to come see me in the office and you wanted to have a hemorrhoid banding, I usually like to have, make sure that someone's had a colonoscopy first, again, taking, or at least make sure they're up to date on their colonoscopies, again, just making sure that cancer's really been taken off the table. And so if someone comes to see me in the office and they want to try hemorrhoid banding, it's something that can be done. Basically, the thing that's tricky about it is that it has to be done while someone's awake. Because the reason that it works so well is that the inside of your body doesn't have as good nerve supply as the outside of your body. That's why sometimes you know, people can watch a colonoscopy happening, and if there's maybe biopsies happening, they don't feel any additional pain. That's because your insides don't have as good nerve supply as your outsides. So we take advantage of that with internal hemorrhoid banding. Basically, we put a speculum in the bottom, and we grab the hemorrhoid bundle. And as long as it doesn't feel sharp, then we can put a, a band on it. It will choke off the blood supply, fall off, usually within five to seven days. Some people find it helpful. Some people don't. There's always a risk of something called early necrosis, where basically the hemorrhoid chokes off the blood supply too soon. Sometimes you have to take someone back to the operating room and cut the rubber band off. It is very rare, but you can have something called pelvic sepsis if this goes awry, and it's a really big deal. You have to go to the operating room. It could be really devastating. So hemorrhoid banding, always something to consider. The only other thing, again, is that you can't do it for folks who are on blood thinning medication. So anyone who takes blood thinning medication for a clotting disorder or for vascular reasons or a heart valve, you can't do this procedure because it's going to choke off the blood supply and fall off and then your blood's not going to stop, you're not going to stop bleeding. So that's going to be a problem. Um, when, like I said, this will happen in the office, most of the time it's really well tolerated, but you have to be awake because we have to make sure that you don't have good sensation of that area. 
rarely, sometimes, people will have maybe more sensation than others because all of us are kind of on a continuum. No one's exactly the same. And so if you're not awake and you can't tell me, yep, I don't feel that, you're okay to put a rubber band there, then God forbid you were to wake up and all of a sudden you have this rubber band around this thing that's super painful. And we can't obviously do hemorrhoid banding of external hemorrhoids because that would be like, oh, let's put this rubber band around your pinky, it will fall off eventually. While true, that's a bad idea. So hemorrhoid banding is always an excellent option for treatment of enlarged internal hemorrhoids. For external hemorrhoids, again, those hemorrhoids that are present on the outside of the anal canal, the ultimate treatment strategy is going to be excisional hemorrhoidectomy. Excisional hemorrhoidectomy is an excellent surgery. It's a fun surgery. I love doing it. However, as I'm sure you can imagine, it's very, very painful. You basically cut the hemorrhoid bundle off the sphincter complex. This is like maybe a maybe a bit more detail, but there are kind of two ways to do it. This is what's traditionally called the open way, where you cut off the hemorrhoid and then you sew everything back together. Excuse me, this is the closed way, and this is the open way, where you have some uh, open wounds on your bottom. Again, very effective surgery. However, if the straining behavior recurs, the hemorrhoids could come back, number one. Number two, there's a lot of pain. And number three, you still need water and fiber. Now, I did the mat when I was preparing for this, presentation, I did a little bit of math because I haven't really done a lot of excisional hemorrhoidectomies. I see probably five to ten hemorrhoid patients a week. I've been here about three years. Counting my maternity leave, that's like 1,440 patients. I've maybe done ten, which is like one percent of people. And again, because most people do really well with the things we talked about. Water, fiber, no straining, no sitting on the toilet for a while. So I just, I feel really passionate about it. I see a lot of people for hemorrhoids. It causes people a lot of distress. So I just want, although this isn't an update, I just wanted to talk about it a little bit. Again, just to talk a little bit about, because this is my area, one of the things that people also get quite distressed about is something called rectal prolapse. Sometimes we'll get called from the emergency department or from a primary care doctor, or people come to see me in the office thinking that this is rectal prolapse, but this is actually that internal hemorrhoid that's prolapsing out internal hemorrhoid that's coming out. This is what's called rectal prolapse. And the way that you can tell the difference is what, this is called circular muscle. You can see these like circular muscle. And so whenever someone comes to see me for rectal prolapse, they're often very distressed. And I talk to them about it and then I show them this picture and I say, does it look like this? And they always say, no. <laughs> so it's usually this. Um, hemorrhoids or rectal prolapse, you don't have to have anything done unless it bothers you. Sometimes that's the other thing. People will come and see me and they say, oh, my primary care doctor said that my hemorrhoids are really enlarged and I have to have something done about them. However, you really don't. You, you don't have to have anything done about them. If you have rectal bleeding, you're gonna have to have a colonoscopy to make sure you don't have like a cancer. But outside that, you really only have to do anything if it's bothering you. And some more pictures of rectal prolapse. Um, I just wanted to show more pictures just so everyone's, this is rectal prolapse. This is the internal hemorrhoid prolapse. I don't know if you guys can see, but this looks different from this. So these are external hemorrhoids and these are internal hemorrhoids. And so this, this is the only time you absolutely have to do something for rectal prolapse, and that is an ischemic rectum. Basically, the rectum has come out, and then the blood supply has been compromised, and now this person's gonna have to go to the operating room emergently. Outside of this situation, you really don't have to do anything if you don't want to. I would be remiss to not talk about anal cancer when talking about hemorrhoids. Again, as this is what I do, I'm very familiar with this area. I see, again, five to 10 hemorrhoid patients a week. About twice a year, someone will come see me for what is thought to be hemorrhoids, and actually it turns out to be anal cancer. So I just wanna talk a little bit about anal cancer. It is uncommon, it is more, uh, it is more rare than colon or rectal cancer. Um, anal cancer primarily is caused by a virus called human papillomavirus or HPV. Um, it can also, it can cause general warts. Um, it can cause abnormal pap smears in women. So um, it's just something to be aware of that women who have had abnormal pap smears or have had HPV are at higher risk for having anal cancer. I guess the, the main point is if there's any concerns, just come see me and I'll tell you. I want to talk a little bit about fissures. Again, this is something that I see regularly. A fissure is a cut in the anal canal that exposes the internal anal sphincter and causes the internal anal sphincter to spasm. And so whenever you go to have a bowel movement, 
it is like going over, over an open cut and it's very, very painful. This is a picture of a fissure. This, all these pictures, all these clinical pictures are things that I've gotten off the internet. So I'm not, there's no HIPAA violations here. Um, again, this is a picture of an anal fissure. The majority of these will heal with conservative management, meaning, again, with the water and the fiber. Um, some of these, what, another treatment method that we can use is basically put some topical cream on there that will make the muscle relax to try to heal it. And then ultimately, if that doesn't work, then we can go to the operating room. The reason I'm talking about this is because I started doing something here three years ago that is a little bit newer. Um, what we used to do is something called a lateral internal sphincterotomy, which basically means we cut that part of the sphincter mechanism and make it relax. Probably about 10 years ago, we started doing, instead of cutting it, we started injecting Botox actually in the area. That Botox will paralyze the muscle to chemically do the same thing, but you don't have the consequences of cutting someone's sphincter muscle. So I just want to talk about this a little bit again because it's a little bit newer. Um, and the Botox is not as effective as cutting the sphincter, um, but it is, I think, effective enough to try at least to not cut someone's sphincter mechanism. And again, I just wanted to stress once more, if there's any kind of rectal bleeding, it's really just best to see your doctor, get yourself a colonoscopy. As I said, colon rectal cancer is very, very treatable. I want to switch gears a little bit and talk a little bit about diverticular disease, which is, again, a main reason that I perform surgery on folks. So again, this is the colon. Um, diverticular disease or diverticulosis are these little pouches that happen in the colon. This is, what, this is kind of a schematic of what it looks like. And this is what it can look like on colonoscopy. The incidence of diverticulosis is lower in younger people, but it is getting higher. Um, about 40% of people the, the age of 60 will have diverticulosis because it gets worse as you get older. About 60% of people by the, by the time they reach the age of 80 will, ha will have some diverticulosis. 95% of diverticulosis is on the left side here. However, there are certain populations that it's more common on the right side. So uh, certainly for in Asian countries, it's more common to have right-sided diverticulitis. When we talk about treatment for diverticulitis, what we talk about primarily is removing this area of your colon to prevent flares of diverticulitis in the future. About 10 to 25% of people with the pouches, so with the diverticulosis, will have diverticulitis. Just because you have diverticulosis doesn't necessarily mean that you need to have anything done, but if it gets inflamed over and over again, then we talk about potentially doing surgery. So the purpose of doing surgery, like I said, is to, this is what the colon normally looks like in its position, and then, like I said, often, this is the area that's inflamed called the sigmoid colon. So this is what it looks like after we, do, after we operate on it. And of course, it never looks like nice, nice in the operating room. This is usually what it looks like. It's thickened, it's angry. Dr. Paul, you agree? Um, surgery for diverticulitis, again, is to remove that inflamed area so that the diverticulitis doesn't happen again. Now, the way that we determine who's going to need surgery and who doesn't is basically, do you have complicated diverticulitis or uncomplicated diverticulitis? Complicated diverticulitis is this, which is basically this is the colon here, and this is this fluid-filled structure next to the colon with an abscess or an infected fluid collection. This is basically just a colon that looks inflamed. So this is acute, uncomplicated diverticulitis, and this is complicated diverticulitis. For people with complicated diverticulitis, the recommendation is that you have surgery. And that's because the risk of it coming back is pretty high. Then the question becomes, who do we operate on for uncomplicated diverticulitis? You know, it's funny, over the years, as things happen in medicine, the recommendation has changed. It used to be, when I was in residency, it was, you know, you had to have this many episodes, you had to be this old, you had to have these medical problems, you had this real algorithmic thinking about it. And as we have looked at the literature and as things have progressed, we've realized basically, if you have uncomplicated diverticulitis and you want to have surgery, and your doctor thinks it's safe for you to have surgery, then you have surgery. It's really up to the patient to determine whether or not that's something that affects their quality of life, whether or not they want to undergo surgery for that. This is the American College of Surgeons, excuse me, the American Society for Colon and Rectal Surgeon Diverticular Disease Management Guidelines. And what I think is interesting is, again, that it's really about 
patients. It's about what do patients want and what is kind of best for them. What is also somewhat interesting is within the past several years, we've discovered that uncomplicated diverticulitis actually can be treated without antibiotics just by backing someone's diet down, which is, again, something that's a little bit um, interesting and somewhat new. What I think is interesting, what I think might be helpful, people always, people are worried about needing a bag or basically needing an ostomy. And so people say, you know, maybe they have their first episode of uncomplicated diverticulitis and they say, you know, I don't want to have a bag emergently. And what I tell those people is that based on the literature, you need to take out 18 people's colons electively to prevent one person from needing an emergency bag. So it's somewhat unusual, if that makes sense. What I think is actually really exciting is that right now there is a multi-institutional study that's ongoing called the COSMID trial, and it's actually looking at best medical management, this is all for uncomplicated diverticulitis, looking at best medical management for uncomplicated diverticulitis versus surgery. They're currently enrolling patients. This is ongoing in 30 different sites, and I think that this is going to give us some really good information and maybe help people who have that uncomplicated diver diverticulitis make those decisions. They have, it's a randomized controlled trial, so as a patient's gonna go to the doctor's office and be randomized one or the other. And then what I think is also really interesting about it is that they're gonna have, for peop people who don't wanna, say, be randomized in a trial as to who has surgery and who doesn't, they're actually gonna do a um, observational cohort. So there's people that say, no, I don't wanna be randomized, but you could just like ask me how I'm doing and kinda see how I'm doing to help us make this decision. So I think this is really interesting, and I think this is potentially gonna help. It's, this started in October 2019. That looks, they're trying to get 500 people, um, and they're looking at quality of life limiting acute uncomplicated diverticulitis. So not just, oh, I had it once and it doesn't really bother me again, but these are the folks who are really gonna be considering surgery. So I think that that's exciting and that's really gonna help us moving forward. I wanna talk a little bit about enhanced recovery after surgery. This is, when you think about, I don't know if anybody in the room is here, has had colon and rectal surgery, but for folks who maybe had to have part of their colon removed 20 or 25 years ago, what that looked like was you came to the hospital, you got admitted the night before surgery, you did your bowel prep in the, op you know, you did the bowel prep in the hospital, you had surgery, you had a big open incision in your abdomen, which sometimes we still do, but um, you know, you had a tube in your nose, you had a Foley catheter in your bladder, you were in the hospital five to seven days. Oh, and then, you know, you're admitted, so you're, now you're in the hospital six to eight days, everybody across the board. And what we've realized is that most people can be what's called fast-tracked, or basically most people will do fine if you, you know, give, advance their diet. And, and so it's really kind of a paradigm shift and a, and a different thought in approaching these patients. The other thing that's helpful about this kind of enhanced recovery practice is that you're really standardizing everything and so it's an it's an order set that's based upon best clinical practices and it starts in pre-op and goes all the way through post-op and so this really kind of standardizes everyone's care it optimizes everyone's care it tries to get them out of the hospital as soon as possible safely and I think it's something that you know we've been working on and has been rolled Jen when, when was it rolled out for colorectal Six months? Yeah. So within the last six months, we've kind of rolled out this called enhanced recovery after surgery. What I think is also really important is that, you know, 20 years ago, maybe the way that patients were treated was very surgeon specific. So coming as a resident, for an example, Maybe this doctor's patients you couldn't give clear liquids to, and maybe this doctor's patients you could, and so everything was very surgeon dependent. And so this, I think, is allowing things to be streamlined again so people get kind of the best practices and everyone gets the best evidence-based care. What else, what else I think is really important about enhanced recovery is that it really is a team effort, and it really starts in the office, it continues in the pre-op area, it's in the hospital, and it's in, you know, in the, um, once people get home. So, as I said, and this isn't just for colorectal surgery, um, urology does this, OBGYN does this, I think ortho does this, 
Um, a, lot of, a lot of surgical specialties will do this. So again, it starts off in the pre-op area. And so it's going to start off with preparation and counseling by the nurses in the office. They're going to say to the patients, this is enhanced recovery surgery. This is what we're doing. And it really takes the ownership. And instead of the patient being sort of a passive element in their operation, they really are brought into the fold and they're more of an active participant in their own care and their own operation. So part of this, if you think about surgery, essentially it's a controlled trauma that happens to your body. And when that happens, there are certain enzymes that are released in your body and your body, you know, you're going to have some pain because you just had surgery. There are certain, certain aspects of your bodily functions are going to be changed a little bit. And so a lot of the thought behind ERAS is let's kind of minimize the trauma as much as possible. So it starts really in the preoperative counseling area. We give patients, it starts off in the, in, the, in the office, we give patients some nutritional drinks to kind of help boost their nutrition in the days before surgery. Because surgery, as I said, is a stress on your body. We want to decrease that stress as much as we can to allow you to heal better. When your body is stressed, you are not going to heal as well. So it starts a couple days before surgery. You're going to get these special little nutritional shakes that you're going to drink the day before surgery and then the day of surgery. We actually give people apple juice or Gatorade or another kind of drink that they will drink the day of surgery. This is like a big, big paradigm shift. So you have to get the nurses on board with this. You have to get the pre-op nurses on board with this. You have to get anesthesia on board with this. They drink this material in the pre-op area, again, to boost the sugar in their body to help decrease the risk of that inflammation in their body. Um, we also give patients antibiotics by mouth and do some other things to help decrease the risk of infection. In the operating room, there's a real push for laparoscopic minimally invasive surgery. Again, if your incisions are smaller, then your pain is going to be less, your body is less affected, you're not mucking around with the intestines as much, and your body goes back to normal faster. The this is a big, a big key where the anesthesia team gets involved. They uh, really tightly control um, temperature. They try to use, they try to really decrease the amount of opioids that they use. They use Tylenol, they use other medications to help decrease that need for opioids. And then after surgery, the nurses are getting these patients to the chair the same day of surgery. They're, they're having them walk around. Um, the nurses are taking people's catheters out of their bladder really soon. And so this allows us to take care of patients faster, get them out of the hospital faster, minimize the amount of trauma on their body so that they heal better. And this is, like I said, something that has been really kind of kicked off for in the past six months. We're then now hoping to, and now just instead of doing this for colorectal surgery, we're happening to extend this to the other general surgery procedures that we do as well. So again, pre-op counseling in the office. We talked about, you know, people are drinking the day of surgery. This is like scandalous. When you tell people they can drink the day of surgery, it is scandalous. And then again, um, decreasing the kind of pain medications that people are getting as well. We talked about intra-op, minimally invasive techniques, opioid sparing, you know, we're really careful with the amount of fluid that we give people, so not everybody needs a ton of IV fluid that they're just going to get puffed up and are going to negatively affect their bowels. We use a lot of numbing medicine, local anesthesia as well. And then again, getting people up walking around, taking their catheters out. When I was a resident and someone has colon surgery, they got liquids. First of all, you didn't give them anything until they passed gas. And then they passed gas, and then you gave them liquids. And then they had a bowel movement, and then you gave them solid food. And like we were keeping these people hostage in the hospital who didn't really need that, right? So as long as someone's not nauseated, they just get to eat whatever they want with understanding that the majority of people are reasonable and if they feel bloated, they're going to stop. And so what that means is that they have earlier return of bowel function and they get out of the hospital fast. They got out of the hospital in three days when maybe previously they would be in the hospital for seven days. And so they aren't, you know, being held hostage in the hospital and that really they aren't maybe taking as many opioid medications and we get, you know, it's, it's a really a win-win for everybody. Again, it's really a team approach and I think that the team here has done such a good job from the nurses in my office to the nurses in the pre-op area to the anesthesia team to the nurses on the floor. Everyone's done such a phenomenal job um, and I think that these patients are really getting, getting a nice operation. So this TAMIS is um, called transanal minimally invasive surgery. So this is how people normally think about the colon and rectum, right? It is one continuous tube, and that's that. 
really, and I get so fired up about the rectum, I love the rectum. And so this really is what the rectum is. The rectum, the majority of the rectum is actually outside the peritoneal cavity, which is where all of your other organs are. And so when I think about the rectum truthfully, and it's not really like this, just floating around. It really, I tell my patients, it's kind of like a balloon in a bony box. And the bony box is these bones, these pelvic muscles, these other organs. And it's just this piece of bowel that is surrounded by lymph nodes that is kind of down in this pelvis. So because of that, we're able to do something called transanal minimal invasive surgery, which basically means that if you, this, so this is a polyp. Back in the day, if you had a polyp that was right here in the rectum, it is too far away from the anus to get it just in the operating room. Basically, you're, you need to have this whole area removed in the operating room to get that polyp out. So a lot of people were having a big surgery for maybe something that didn't need a big surgery. And so we take advantage of the anatomic constraints of the rectum and basically are able to, again, we're gonna talk a little bit about how we don't, remember we talked about how we don't know if polyps are cancer, we assume everything's a cancer until proven otherwise. Remember we talked about that? So we use these materials that we already have in the hospital that we do for laparoscopic surgery and we basically inflate the rectum as though it was your abdomen and we're taking out your gallbladder and we do a full thickness excision of the polyp. So this is kind of what it looks like. And so you get this full thickness excision, send it to the pathologist, and make sure that it's just a polyp. Now the good news is, if it's just a polyp, then you're done. And if it's rectal cancer or something a little bit more invasive, then that's something that probably is gonna need some additional surgery. As I said, I adore the rectum, which is why I'm a colorectal surgeon. And so I wanna talk a little bit about the rectum. Again, We'll talk a little bit more about the rectum, I should say. So again, the rectum is down in the pelvis. And so although it looks like it's just like continuation of the colon, the rectum really is different given its anatomic constraints. I want to talk a little bit about the treatment of rectal cancer because it's important and there have been a lot of exciting advancements. When you think about the rectum, there really are three distinct zones. So there's this upper zone, which part of it's in the abdominal cavity. There's this middle zone and then this lower zone. The lower zone and the middle zone really are like zero to seven and seven to 12 centimeters. Um, you can tell the rectum from the colon in the operating room based upon, you know, the rectum doesn't have any, what's called tenia coli, which is uh, this, this little stripe of muscle here. Um, the rectum doesn't have any epiploic appendages or are these little fat things that hang off the colon. And like I said, the peritoneum flops over the rectum. So really, oh geez. Um, the majority of the rectum is outside the abdominal cavity. Okay. So when we talk about treatment for rectal cancer, rectal cancer and colon cancer are treated differently. It's not just like the colon. Like the colon, we make sure there's not cancer anywhere else in your body and then you go to surgery. But given the fact that the rectum is technically different, and in an anatomically challenging space, the rectum is treated differently. So rectal cancer, the, the tenets of rectal cancer are chemoradiation, surgery, and additional systemic chemotherapy. Again, let's talk about the anatomical constraints. So one of my mentors used to say you have one shot to get it right in the pelvis because of there's this very specific plane if you're gonna operate on the rectum, it's like you're one cell layer away from being in a bad time. If you are too close to the rectum, you're gonna be in this lymph node packet, and that's not gonna be the correct cancer operation. And if you're one cell too deep, you're gonna be in the presacral venous plexus, and that's a bad time. So I just wanted to show this. This is what it looks like in the operating room. Basically, this is the plane you're supposed to be in, what's called the mesorectal plane. I love this so much. This is my favorite operation. And this is, this is beautiful. And this is what it's supposed to look like. So just to kind of wrap it up a little bit with rectal cancer updates, Rectal cancer care is very specialized. Again, because it's tricky to get down there surgically. You really have one shot to do it well. And because of that, when we talk about how people are treated for rectal cancer, it really is important that we, w that we talk about multidisciplinary tumor boards. We're gonna talk a little bit about the changes to staging. We're gonna talk a little bit about locally advanced versus early rectal cancer. And we're gonna talk about how the rectal cancer care is really, the paradigm is really shifted. 
So again, um, rectal care really has become more and more subspecialized as time has gone on. In 2011, this um, Ostrich Consortium was founded, which stands for the Optimizing Surgical Treatment of Rectal Cancer. Um, again, to make sure that rectal cancer patients were getting the correct operations and, and having the correct course of treatment. These folks got together with the American College of Surgeons, the American Society for Colon and Rectal Surgeons, the Society for Surgical Oncologists, the College of American Pathologists, SAGES, and the American College of Radiology formed NAPRAC, which is a special accreditation that hospitals can acquire that basically says that you are accredited to take care of rectal cancer, which is something that I'd really like to do here because I think that it would be really important and make sure that everyone's kind of getting uh, the kind of care that they need. Being a NAPRAC accredited hospital means that you're going to get educational mod modules and you're going to have clinical standards in place to make sure that rectal cancer patients are, are getting what, what they need. One of those is a multidisciplinary tumor board that all rectal cancers should be presented at. We have, multi, we have GI tumor boards. I believe we have breast cancer tumor boards. Um, and what that means is basically someone from myself or someone like Dr. Paul from surgery is gonna get in the same room with a medical oncologist, a radiation oncologist, a pathologist, and a radiologist. And it really helps us make sure that we're all on the same page and we're all doing the right stuff. There have been some changes to staging again when I was in residency. Because of those anatomic constraints of the rectum, in addition to, this is the stuff you do for colon cancer. So you do this blood test, and then you do a CT scan of your chest, abdomen, and pelvis. Because the rectum is different and special, like we talked about, we, you also have to look at the tumor specifically to figure out how far has the tumor gone through the wall, and is it, does it look like there are lymph nodes that are involved in this rectal cancer. We used to do a transanal ultrasound, which the GI doctors will do. And it used to say you could do this or you could do an MRI, but really, at this point, MRI is preferred over endorectal ultrasound because it's objective. It's the same way, we do it the same way every time. It's something that I can easily pull up in the operating room or the radiation oncologist can easily pull up when they're planning their radiation therapy. Again, when we talk about rectal cancer, it really is locally advanced versus early rectal cancer. Early rectal cancer is gonna go right to, op right to surgery. Locally advanced rectal cancer, again, back to the pictures, means that potentially this tumor has gone through to this little fatty area, and potentially some of these lymph nodes, which are located in this little fat packet, have cancer in them. What we have found through trial and error and through examining the literature is that people with rec locally advanced rectal cancer do better if they get chemo and radiation first. And this is something that's really important. So locally advanced rectal cancer, you're gonna need to have chemo and radiation, and then I'm gonna come in and take it out and then they're gonna have additional surgery. Something that we've, has been ongoing for probably the last five years is that, again, this is for locally advanced rectal cancer. They do the chemo radiation, then surgery, then more chemotherapy. But 45% of people weren't finishing this and finishing up this, this additional chemotherapy because they're tired and because they've been through a lot and because chemo can be rough. And this is really the thing that's gonna help right? This is really the thing that's going to kill off any cancer cells that are floating around in your body. And so, like I said, probably within the last five years, we've started to switch it up a little bit and say, let's give everything up front and then we'll do surgery. And that's something called total new adjuvant therapy. That's something that we started doing here. Um, something I'm really excited about. And basically, it makes sure that everyone gets the treatment that they need and then gets surgery to make sure that you know, they're gonna have the, the best possible outcome. And what's interesting is that when we're looking at, these patients aren't doing worse by doing this new thing, they're actually doing a little bit better. The pathologic response rate, so basically looking at the um, pathology of the rectum is increased, so people are, the tumors are shrinking and they're, and they're doing better. Um, and again, I just wanted to talk, this is a little busy and this is a little crazy, but basically the total neoadjuvant therapy is really the preferred route now, which is a big, big shift in rectal cancer treatment. This is something I think is really interesting. The American College of Colon and Rectal Surgeons just came out with this guidelines for frailty evaluation. You know, as the population is getting older, the population is gonna need more and more surgery. And so this is something that we will do in the office, all surgeons do this in the office. If you're about to operate on an 85 year old individual, you're gonna say, how are you doing at home? Are you able to take care of yourself? Who do you live with? Are you able to cook and clean and, and do those kinds of things? Because, for people who are a little bit more frail 
they're obviously going to have a harder time with recovery of surgery. And the other thing about frailty, it's not necessarily, it's not really your, your age and years, it's really your physiological age. So my in-laws love saying that they're old, but they're like more active than some people my age. Do you know what I'm saying? <laughs> so like it really matters what your physiological age is. Um, we have, we can do some frailty screening in the, in the office, basically just different things to kind of test and see how people are doing from that standpoint. Um, it's really, and again, these are all things that we do, but I think it's really interesting that it's coming out in, well, as formal guidelines of, you know, these treatment plans have to align with patient's goals of care. I'll give you an example. There's a patient that I've taken care of who had a recurrence of a rectal tumor. This individual is a little bit older. I did the TAMIS surgery, got that tumor out. This individual said, I said to them, you know, you probably, based on the fact that this thing has come back, you probably should have formal surgery. I don't think that's a great plan given your age and other medical problems. So we said, let's just take this out this way to get this out of here and stop giving you a problem. And so treating him based upon the things that he wants and his goals of care. Like, yeah, I don't want a big surgery, but can you just get this thing out of here? So that's what we did. Um, you know, it's really important to screen people for, de for delirium preoperatively to make sure that they're going to do okay in the hospital afterwards. And then again, um, you know, these folks all should be minimally invasive approach if we can, ERAS protocol if we can. Um, what I thought was so interesting was that screening people for social vulnerability, which means, you know, what kind of social connections do you have? And then giving the people who maybe are at more vulnerable state socially, giving those folks the resources that they need actually will improve their care. So there was a study where uh, individuals above the age of 70 were having surgery for colon cancer, and the people who had more social connections and less psychological distress actually had better quality of life scores after surgery, which I think is really important. So this is my beautiful baby girl. Her name is Caitlin Grace. I wanted to say thank you for listening. And thank you for listening to my updates in colorectal surgery, and I'm happy to take any questions or comments. Yeah. Yeah. So you mentioned um, HPV as a contributing factor for rectal cancer. Anal cancer. Anal cancer. Yep. Okay. So my question there is, with all of the proliferation of Gardasil yeah. that we all made our teenagers take, and yep. we didn't get. Right. As as life goes on, will there be less? We we hope so. We certainly hope so and think so. And that was really kind of the point of that. And thank you for mentioning that. Um, is that we we hope that it will. That better. Yeah. And then I noticed on the early slide, it looked like colorectal screening stopped at age seventy five. Yeah. So that is um, individual based. Again, kind of if really the the question to ask someone who is seventy five or seventy six. If you had colon cancer, would you want to have surgery? If they say yes, then those people should keep screening. If they said, absolutely not, get away from me, then maybe don't screen those people. I think that the issue was, you know, we're screening people who are older and not having that sort of nuanced discussion. We're not going to make an 82-year-old get colon cancer screening if they're like, don't, I'm not going not gonna to do this. Which is different, again, if you're a very, perhaps very robust uh, person of, above the age of 75, which certainly would want surgery. And is, is ERAS for everyone? ERAS, yep. Yeah, so e, or, uh, ERAS. Yes, it is. The only people that you can't do it for, first of all, you can do like all of those. Like I routinely will do minimally invasive surgery. A lot of that stuff we'll do for everybody. There are certain medications you can't give people who take chronic opioids. But outside that, ERAS is absolutely for everybody. Thank you so much, Dr. Thank you. Field. It was Thank a you. Wonderfully informative presentation. Thank, thank you. For your time today. Thank you. Uh, and to everyone here, thank you for joining us today. On behalf of the entire staff of the Concord Hospital Trust, we wish you a very healthy, safe, and happy new year.